to turn to page 13 of our course books, song number six, and sing the tune that was just being played, Christ Died for Me, page 13. When I was lost, all hope was gone, I couldn't find my way back home. My Lord heard me in my distress and showed me that he died for me. Christ died for me on Calvary. His precious blood was shed for me, and now I'm free from Satan's bond, and all because Christ died for me. The love he has can ne'er be told, the price he paid to save my soul. Taking my guilt and all my blame, and humbling and open shame. Christ died for me on Calvary. His precious blood was shed for me, and now I'm free from Satan's bond. And all because Christ died for me. The Savior hung on Calvary's tree. There in the place that belonged to me. God held him there in agony. Paying my debt when he died for me. Christ died for me. On Calvary, his precious blood was shed for me, and now I'm free from Satan's bond, and all because Christ died for me. A million years will just begin, eternity will never end. Those nails our hands will remind me of the debt he paid when he died for me. Christ died for me on Calvary. His precious blood was shed for me. And now I'm free from Satan's bond. And all because Christ died for me. Yes, I was lost, but now I'm found. And by His grace, I'm heaven bound. My only hope, my only plea, is that Christ died, and He died for me. Christ died for me on Calvary. His precious blood was shed for me. And now I'm free from Satan's bond. And all because Christ died for me. Amen. All right. Robert's going to come and read for us now. Good morning. Good morning. Psalm 140, the reading of the Lord's word. Deliver me, O Lord, from the evil man. Preserve me from the violent man, which imagine mischiefs in their heart. Continually are they gathered together for war. They are sharp in their tongues like a serpent. Adder's poison is under their lips. Keep me, O Lord, from the hands of the wicked. Preserve me from the violent man, who have purpose to overthrow my goings. Proud have hit a snare for me in cords. They have spread a net by the wayside. They have set gins for me. I said unto the Lord, Thou art my God. Hear the voice of my supplications, O Lord. 
O God, the Lord, the strength of my salvation, thou hast covered my head in the day of battle. Grant not, O Lord, the desires of the wicked, further not his wicked devices, lest they exalt themselves. As for the head of those that compass me about, but the mischief of their own lips cover them. Let burning coals fall upon them, let them be cast into the fire, into the deep pits, that they rise not up again. Let not an evil speaker be established in the earth. Evil shall hunt the violent man to overthrow him. I know that the Lord will maintain the cause of the afflicted and the right of the poor. Surely the righteous shall give thanks unto thy name. The upright shall dwell in thy presence. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you now and we praise you. You are worthy to be praised. We thank you for this word. Each and one of us can attest that our hearts are desperately wicked, but we are thankful that Christ is our salvation. Be with Brother Ken today as he delivers the word. Open our hearts to receive it. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. A precious word. Let's take our bulletins and on the inside cover we'll sing this hymn to the tune of Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. Great Jehovah, our salvation, God of mercy and of grace, who sent Christ to save his nation, his dear sheep from every race. Now we love him, Christ our Savior, he who reigns o'er all to bless. All his people with salvation, praise the Lord, our righteousness. There's a peace that knows no ending in the Savior's loving arms. With our precious Lord's attending, keeping safe from all alarms. How we love him, Christ our Savior, he who reigns o'er all to bless. All his people with salvation, praise the Lord, our righteousness. We rejoice in our redemption, earned by Christ our great high priest. He who reigns without exemption intercedes for us to plead. How we love him, Christ our Savior, he who reigns for all to bless. All his people with salvation, praise the Lord our righteousness. We could well sing that, how he loves us, Christ our Savior. We love him because he first loved us. All right, Bob's coming to read. Good morning, Galatians 5. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty with Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Ye did run well. Who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? This persuasion cometh not from him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth 
the whole lump. I have confidence in you through the Lord that ye will be none otherwise minded. But he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. I would they were even cut off which trouble you. For brethren, ye have been called into liberty. Only use not your liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that they cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulsions, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in the time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against these there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Gracious Heavenly Father, again we thank you for this opportunity to read the Word. We pray you will open our eyes to see Christ and Christ alone in these words. To know that He is the righteous, our righteousness. We are sinners, dear Lord. Again, be with Ken as he brings forth and pro proclaims our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, hymn number 329 in our hymn books, 329. We'll stand and sing this together, sitting at the feet of Jesus, 329. <laughs> Sitting at the feet of Jesus, oh, what words I hear him say, happy place so near, so precious, may it find me there each day. Sitting at the feet of Jesus, I would look upon the past. For his love has been so gracious, it has won my heart at last. Sitting at the feet of Jesus, where can mortal be more blessed? There I lay my sins and sorrows, and when weary find sweet rest, sitting at the feet of Jesus, there I love to weep and pray, while I from his fullness gather, grace and comfort every day. Bless me, O oh my Savior, bless me, as I sit low at thy feet. Oh, look down in love upon me, let me see thy face so sweet. 
Give me, Lord, the mind of Jesus. Make me holy as he is. May I prove I've been with Jesus, who is all my righteousness. Amen. You may be seated. David's coming to read for us. Exodus 25, verses 31 through 4. And thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold. Of beaten work shall the candlestick be made. His shaft and his branches, his bowls, his knots, and his flowers shall be of the same. And six branches shall come out of the side of it. Three branches of the candlestick out of the one side, and three branches of the candlestick out of the other side. Three bowls made like unto almonds, with a mouth and a flower in one branch, and three bowls made like almonds in the other branch, with a mouth and a flower. So in the six branches that come out of the candlestick. And in the candlestick shall be four bowls made like unto almonds, with their knots and their flowers. And there shall be a knot on the two branches of the same, and a knot on the two branches of the same, and a knot on the two branches of the same according to the six branches that proceed out of the candlestick. Their knots and their branches shall be of the same. All of it shall be one beaten work of pure gold. Thou shalt make the seven lamps thereof, and they shall light the lamps thereof, that they may give light over against them. And the tongs thereof, and the snuff dishes thereof, shall be of pure gold. Of a talent of pure gold shall be made with all these vessels. And look that thou make them after the pattern which was showed thee in the mount. While these objects of gold and light represent Christ's perfect and spotless divine nature, his sacrifice was accepted because he was without sin. Open our hearts to understand his word. And then we pray. Well, this is the portion of scripture that we have before us today. This is our custom going through some of these passages in the Old Testament, looking for types of Christ as we prepare for the Lord's table. And this portion that Brother David has just read for us, we have the golden candlestick. As we've been looking at different items that the Lord ordained should be part of the tabernacle, within the tabernacle. We've seen the ark, we've seen the mercy seat, we've seen the table of showbread and now we come to the candlestick and while some of this may seem menial as you read through the scriptures no part of it is to be taken for granted because as we've seen every part of that tabernacle pertains to the Lord Jesus Christ and so when we read may the Lord give us eyes to slow down mind to slow down eyes to see how these things pertain to Christ. And no matter how many times I've read these portions of scripture and even preached from them, it seems that there's always something new that I missed before. And when you read it, you wonder, well, how on earth could I have missed that? But as we go down through, I pray the Lord will indeed be our teacher. And I'm sure as some do when I finish preaching, they come up and say, well, have you considered this? While you were preaching, the Lord brought this to my eye. That's a good thing. Nothing that I have to say here is exhaustive, especially as it pertains to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is infinite in all of his glory and person. And so, really three parts to this message. One is to consider the instructions that were given here concerning the lampstand. And even as the last verse of my text says, Look that thou made them after their pattern, which was showed thee in the mount. This is what the Lord had given to Moses concerning how the tabernacle was to be built. And every detail was important because it pertained to the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're going to look at the lampstand itself. And then the second part here, the lamps for the lampstand. You've got the lamp stand on which the fixture was built and based, and then out of that middle lamp stand, you had three and three. So a total 
of seven particular bowls or lights are described here in verse 37. Thou shalt make the seven lamps thereof. So the one going up the middle had its lamp, three branches off to the one side, three branches off to the other, and together it made the complete candlestick. Now, the thing that I wanted to bring out here, and again, the third part of this is really to see how all of this pertains to Christ, because this is not just a lesson in design or building, but what it had to do with regard to the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'll not get into those specifics, or I'll try to stay out of too many of the specifics until we get to that third point. But here, it was to be made of pure gold. And that the lampstand was hammered out of pure gold. In fact, it says there in verse 39, of a talent of pure gold. Out of one piece or talent of gold, this entire lampstand was to be built. And what's interesting here, and I thought maybe I missed it, because I looked at some other references, but there's really no dimension that is given for the lampstand like it was for the Ark of the Covenant, specific dimensions. The one specific detail that's given here was that the entire thing be beat out, hammered out of pure gold, and that it was to be after the pattern that is laid out here in these instructions. There's that modern day menorah that some have seen in Jewish tradition today that they liked, sadly without any clue as to how that ever pertained to the Messiah, although they still look for a Messiah to come, just not Jesus of Nazareth. So all of their traditions are still thinking that somehow there's going to be this other Messiah that's going to come and deliver Israel. They're still very Israel-centric in their thinking, not seeing how the Lord Jesus Christ fulfilled it all. Now there's some variance when it says here in verse 39 of a talent of pure gold. It depends on who you read. Some say that that's right around 75 pounds in weight because a talent is a weight of gold. Some say that is as much as 85 to 90 pounds. But either way, we're talking about a very solid candlestick that was built that way to be able to withstand the, the time and also well placed and founded where it was put there in the tabernacle. So you had the lampstand that is mentioned there in verse 31 that is called the candlestick. That's the middle part, it says it's his shaft. So this is the one that, that came up from the ground all the way to the top. And then his branches, his bowls, his knobs, and his flowers shall be the same. So everything that was gone out from this particular candlestick was the same as what that candlestick was. And so the six branches that are described here in verse 32 and 33 actually all the way down to verse 36, it describes these as coming out of the sides of the candlestick. Three branches on the one side, three branches on the other. And then on top of these branches, there were bowls, and the purpose of the bowl, of course, was to put oil in them for burning. That's why it mentions here in verse 38, the tongs thereof, the snuff dishes. This was oil that was put in that was to be burnt to serve as a light for the inner portion of the tabernacle. You can imagine without this light, it was dark. When the priest went into that, we're talking about the holy place. There were three parts. There's a courtyard to the tabernacle. There was a holy place. And then there was the most holy place into which only the high priest could go once a year, but that not without blood. But this particular part here, the priest would go in and out daily to minister unto the Lord. 
this is where the activity took place. And so in this particular inner sanctuary of the tabernacle is where the lamp stand stood and the bowls were lit. The oil was lit as the light. It was the only light of the tabernacle. There was a curtain coming in to this part from the outside court that would have darkened out any outside light. And then there was the veil on the inner part. But you can imagine without this light, it was darkness. There was no light. And so from these three bowls, it describes that they are made like unto almonds. The almond blossom. This was always the very first tree to blossom in the land of Israel in the springtime. You knew when you saw the almond tree blossom that the Lord had brought life back to those otherwise dead trees. And again, I'm going to refrain from application here other than just give you the detail at this particular point. But this is how these bowls were made. When it speaks of a knock, it's like the bud, because it says that each bowl made unto like unto an almond with a knob and a flower. So when you see the flower, you think of something that's already bloomed, but the knob is the bud. Sometimes if I go to buy a plant and I don't see only a few flowers on it, I look around on the other branches to see if maybe there's some other buds that are ready to blossom because that tells me then that it's a good plant. There's life in it. A few have already blossomed and then the knops or the buds indicate there's more to come. So all of this is an indication of life. But each one had a flower and a knop for each branch. And the three bowls made like almonds. In the other branch with a knop and a flower. The consistency of what we see here into in how this was to be made. So in the six branches that came out of the candlestick, this is way, the way it was to look. And in the candlestick shall be four bowls, again, made like unto almonds. That's on, on the candlestick itself with their knops and their flowers. And there shall be a knop under two branches of the same, and a knop under two branches of the same, and a knop under two branches of the same, according to the six branches that proceed out of the candlestick. Their knops and their branches shall be of the same. All of it shall be one beaten and pure gold. That's the consistency that we find here with regard to how this particular lampstand was to be built. So now we get to the part which I believe is the most vital in considering what we've just read here, and that's how these materials of the lampstand point us to the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's a lot here that we can consider. First of all, let's look at the fact that it was to be made of pure gold. What does gold represent in Scripture other than the divinity or deity of the person? So as a picture of Christ, I believe here in the lampstand, it represents the divinity of Christ. The foundation of it being planted on the earth, the base of it, which is who Christ was in the flesh. And yet made of pure gold in that he was God in the flesh. You could take and physically look at the lampstand and see a physical representation of who Christ was. But when Christ came to this earth, even though he was the lampstand, even though he was the light, yet men did not perceive him as the light. You say, well, why is that? Well, you can't see if you're blind. It's just like many of these that had this representation that God 
had given of his son in a type and picture, and yet so many came in and went out and never perceived that these things pertain to the Lord Jesus Christ. If you look over in Hebrews chapter 4, this is what we find here written by the writer to the Hebrews concerning the people of Israel and how they entered not in because of unbelief. In Hebrews 3.19, it says, So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Here they had all of these types and pictures and symbols about them, and yet were unbelievers still, which mean, unbelief means rebels. It means that they did not see, even as with Christ, they didn't see Christ in Christ. And that's why the writer says in chapter 4 and verse 1, let us therefore fear. Notice, lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest. That's what the Lord said, come unto me all ye that labor and heavy laden, I will give you rest. When the gospel is preached, it's a gospel of promise of salvation in Christ. Yet not all will hear it. In fact, none will hear it unless God by his spirit opens the heart of those sinners that he's purpose should hear it. And uh, they're given eyes to see and ears to hear. But the warning still goes out to any of you lest you should seem to come short of it. I think about how many people, whether it's physically in person or sitting under this gospel or whether it be over the internet, listening to messages that they go forth, talking here about the true gospel. And yet they, they see but don't see. They hear but they don't hear. It's just information. It would be like, a voice passing by a person that's deaf. They can see the lips moving, but they don't have a hearing to be able to hear. And as God purposed, there were many in Israel back in this day, even with the glory of this tabernacle and all that it represented. I don't know as I've ever seen anything myself of this importance like a candlestick made of pure gold. I do know this, that if you had that somewhere in an art gallery and people walk by, they'd take a, another look at it and pull back and they'd start doing something with it. Maybe he'd start trying to chew on to see is this real gold or is this just made of some fashion of gold? We're talking about pure gold here. And that's who Christ was in the flesh, God in the flesh. John spoke of him who our hands have touched and our eyes have, have seen the word of life. And yet, as he walked on this earth, there were many that walked by and never perceived who he was. And that's what the writer here of the Hebrews is warning of, that we be not of that number. No matter how much head knowledge that we might have and be able to speak of factually concerning this man, Jesus of Nazareth. And yet, if we don't see him as God sees him, as God in the flesh come to save his people, then we've not seen him. And here's the warning, particularly in verse 2 of Hebrews 4, for unto us the gospel is preached. For unto us was the gospel preached. Notice, as well unto them, so Christ had not even come yet, and yet the gospel was being preached unto them. You say, how? In these very types and images that we're considering together here. In the Ark of the Covenant, in the mercy seat, in the table of showbread, in the candlestick. This is the gospel being preached. But it says here, the word preached did not profit them. We're talking about to the saving of their souls. You talk about a condemnation. That light, Christ said there in John 3, light is come into the world. So that's what we're talking about here with the candlestick. Light is come into the world, but men loved darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. 
a lot of people think that as long as they're still up and around and walking in this world that they haven't uh, faced God's judgment yet. They think of that as to when I die, okay, then I'll have to do No. Right now, in this world, to have this message being preached and people give it no consideration at all, how great is that darkness? We have a lot of people that have the facts Natural light is the way I look at it. They can tell you, oh, yeah, I believe Jesus. There's a man called Jesus who came in this world. He laid down his life. He died. He rose again and said it on high. We all know that. That's how people reason. But what is the significance of all of that? How has the Lord been pleased to open your heart to that one that you profess to know? A lot of people have natural light. And I'm talking just about being able to cite the facts. They've been sitting around long enough and reading the Bible long enough to where they've got some information. But I'll tell you, there's no greater condemnation than to have this word and yet still not have Christ. Here it says it did not profit them. Why? Not being mixed with faith and them that heard it. How can it be mixed with faith other than the spirit granting that faith. That's Faith isn't something that you come up with. We're so depraved, left to ourselves, we could never believe. We could believe some facts, but we could never believe on this one, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that was the condemnation that there was, that light has come to the world, but men love darkness rather than light. Oh, if the Lord has been pleased to open your eyes and mine, Give him thanks because there's so many that have some facts and some, some detail but don't know Christ. But coming back here to my text again, this, the, the reason I'm saying this is here is a representation of Christ as God in the flesh. And yet it said of Christ, he came unto his own, his own received him not. But as many as received him, I'm thankful that this doesn't stop with that one verse. He came unto his own, his own received him not. No, as many as received him. How is it that any have received him, welcomed him, believed on him, rested in him? It's because he has given them the power to become the sons of God, even them that believe on his name. But here's a part that, again, you read over this and think, okay, Gold represents the deity of Christ, but the part here that I have read before and yet never really given much consideration, although in the preparation it just jumped out at the page to me, and that is that this particular gold was to be hammered out. Now you think about how you take gold and shape it into any form. What does it take to do it? It takes fire. It's through the fire that this gold then was hammered out and made into this candlestick. And I believe in that we have a representation of the sufferings of the Lord Jesus Christ. In that he's God in the flesh and yet as a man his deity in all points, this gold being hammered out represents the sufferings of the Lord Jesus Christ through the fire. And the Lord spoke to his disciples and they were talking about who would sit on his right or left hand, which if you read the Bolton article that I wrote, it struck me that they didn't even know what they were asking. You wouldn't want to be on the left hand. When you go and read about those that are on his left hand, those are the goats. There's only one place of honor, and that comes through the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's on his right hand. And that's not for man to earn or merit, but it's for Christ to give. But the Lord warned them and said, you don't even know what you ask. Can you be baptized with the baptism wherewith I must be baptized? He's talking about his death and his suffering. And so even here, with regard to this gold. Yes, it was one talent of gold. That's who God is in his oneness with Christ. Can't separate it. 
He didn't stop being God coming in the flesh. And yet, this gold for the making of this particular candlestick had to be hammered out. Had to be made, when it says there in verse 39, of a talent of pure gold shall he make it with all of the vessels. That's how it was made. But through the fire, it shaped and formed. And I believe that represents the sufferings of our Lord Jesus Christ. The third thing that I see here of importance is the number seven. You see there in verse 37, yes, it had three on one side, three on another, and then the candlestick in the middle. That made a total of seven. And it says, Thou shalt make the seven lamps thereof, and they shall light the lamps thereof, that they may give light over against it one over against another. Seven in scripture is the number of divine perfection or a number of completion. You can't add to or take from what this represents. This is the amazing thing about the Lord Jesus Christ. He was 100% God as if he were not man. And yet, in his perfection as a man, he was 100% man. He was no less man than he was God. That's the mystery of godliness. God was made flesh. And uh, it's the number of perfection. Over in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 4, keep your hand here because we'll be back, but in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 4, the book of Revelation is a figurative book. It's a book of numbers. If you haven't figured that out, you're going to misinterpret it. But we get this right from the beginning in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 4. I've had some tell me, well, I'm a literalist. I believe in the literal interpretation of Scripture. Well, I do too. I believe in the literal spiritual interpretation of Scripture. There's a lot of natural interpretation going on. And here's an example. It says in verse 4, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come. There's a description of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is, he always was from eternity and is to come. Coming again. But notice here, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Now, if you understand that in a literal, natural sense, you can think, well, there's seven spirits then that represent God. But that number seven represents completion, represents the perfection of God as spirit. So don't think literally in terms of seven different spirits, but the complete Godhead being represented by the Spirit of God through the Father and through the Son. We see the same thing over in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 5. So, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, this is not just pulling something out of the hat here. Here again, we see the same description in Revelation 4, 5, and out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were what? Seven lamps of fire burning before the throne. I wonder what that imagery is. Seven lamps of fire? What did God say to Moses? Make sure that you build everything according to the pattern as it is in heaven. It's a representation of Christ in heaven. The seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are what? The seven spirits of God. So even here, we see a picture of Christ in whom the spirit of God dwells without measure. In reality, there's Father, Son, and Spirit that are described there in verse 5. Because it says they're before the throne of God. They're, they're the spirits of God, the God the Father. The lampstand represents Christ and then the seven spirits. But all are one, as we see here. And in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 1, one more passage here, jumped over it, we can come back. 
Notice, and unto the angel or the messenger of the church of Sardis, in Sardis, write, these things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know thy works that thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. There we see the seven spirits of God picturing again the spirit of God working in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. The seven stars represent those seven churches that he's writing to there, which is Christ's church. So there are the number seven, perfection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Two more things that I want us to consider here in this portion coming back. Let's talk about the almond blossom. These were hammered into the shape, again, on branches of the lampstand. When you think of an almond, what do you think of? I think of Aaron's rod. That's one thing that pops in my mind, because if you think in the tabernacle, inside of that covenant, Ark of the Covenant, was Aaron's rod that had what? Budded. And uh, that goes back to Numbers chapter 17, if you look there with me. Numbers chapter 17. And what we're going to see concerning these almonds, remember we already saw that the almond blossom was the first to blossom in that part of the world in the springtime. And so what is it a picture of but life? Where you see the knot, where you see the bud, where you see the flower. It depicts life. In fact, the whole candlestick with the light. He's the light. The light is the life of men, of sinners. So when you think of the almond blossom and why it was so significant that every one of those bowls should be hammered out in the shape of an almond, it's a depiction of Christ as the life. And here specifically, with regard to the budding of Aaron's rod, you think about a staff that was dead, it had no life in it. And yet to demonstrate that Aaron was the Lord's anointed, just like Christ is the Lord's anointed, that's what the word Messiah means, anointed one, that out of that rod which was dead should come forth life. And here, the comparison is with Christ who died and yet out of his death comes forth life. That scepter of righteousness which is in his hand came through his death and blossomed forth into life. Here in number 17, the Lord spake unto Moses saying, speak unto the children of Israel and take of every one of them a rod according to the house of their fathers, of all their princes according to the house of their fathers, 12 rods. Write thou every man's name upon his rod, and thou shalt write Aaron's name upon the rod of Levi, for one rod shall be for the head of the house of their fathers, and thou shalt lay them up in the tabernacle of the congregation before the testimony. It's before the ark, where I will meet with you. And it shall come to pass that the man's rod, whom I shall choose, shall blossom, and I will make to cease from me the murmurings of the children of Israel, whereby they murmur against you. And so Moses spake unto the children of Israel, and every one of their princes gave him a rod apiece, for each prince, one according to their father's house, even twelve rods, and the rod of Aaron was among their rods. And Moses laid up the rods before the Lord in the tabernacle of witness. And it came to pass that on the morrow, Moses went into the tabernacle of witness, and behold, the rod of Aaron, or the house of Levi was budded and brought forth buds and blossomed, blossomed, and bloomed the blossoms and yielded what? Almonds. This was a rod made out of an almond tree. Dead, having been cut, this was a rod of authority for each household, and yet out of that blossomed now the almonds. And Moses brought all, out all the rods from before the Lord unto all the children of Israel, and they looked took every man his rod, and the Lord said unto Moses, Bring Aaron's rod again before the testimony to be 
kept for a token against the rebels. And thou shalt quite take away their murmurings from thee, that they die not. And Moses did so, so the Lord commanded him. And the children of Israel spake unto Moses, saying, Behold, we die, we perish, we all perish. Do you see what this, this blossom represents? It represents hope. That out of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, again, that gold being hammered out, these blossoms, these almond blossoms, represent hope that without Christ, without his death, and not only his death, without his resurrection, that's what it represents. Life through his death, yes, but how do we know God has accepted the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ and his death? It's through his raising again, the resurrection. I hope we never... Look at another blossom. I don't know if we have any uh, almond blossoms around here. I know I'm supposed to eat almonds to be in good health. I chew on them, but I don't know as I've ever seen an almond tree, an almond blossom, but I might start looking around as a reminder that this is a representation of the life that is in the Lord Jesus Christ and how glorious he is. And then two other Illustrations coming back here to Exodus chapter 25, and we could spend an entire time on each of these. But as pertaining the oil that goes into those lamps to be burnt, what does the oil represent in Scripture but the Spirit of God? We've already seen the seven spirits, seven lamps, but the oil representing His work, that everything that the Lord Jesus Christ did, the light that shines forth is going to be through the work of the Spirit revealing himself. And then the final point to bring out is the light itself, coming back to the light. What was the lampstand all about? It was about the light that was shining. Now, I know on one aspect we could say, well, Christ is the light of the world, but here, this was not the light that the world could perceive or see. The priests going in and out saw it. But this was a light that was specific to this tabernacle. And the tabernacle represents Christ's body. We could say that it represents his church. And so this is a light that was lit in Christ, revealed specifically for that people. For whom he came into this world and for whom he paid to sin debt, for whom he was established upon this earth to be that light. Not all men see this light. The light shines, but men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. That's the condemnation. But I'll tell you this again, because what is Christ made of us? Over in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 6, it says that he is made of us a kingdom of priests. Christ is the high priest, and even as the priests in the Old Testament serve their high priest, so we serve Christ, but we do so through the light that he has been pleased to give us. That light has not been given to everybody, even as this light of the tabernacle was none other than the light of Christ himself. There was no natural light in it. And I dare say with regard to the church that there's no natural light in the church. Now, when I talk about the church, I'm not just talking about the meeting place. There are many people that come and sit and listen and go for a while, but I'm talking about those that by God's grace he has redeemed. Christ said, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against us. The church is not a building with four walls. Here the church meets at the corner of Baird Road and McAdoo. But the building is not the church. The people that are the lords that gather here, and there's often a mixed congregation where there's wheat, there are tares. But I'll tell you this, the light shines within the tabernacle of Christ's body, that is, his children. Look over with me in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Look what Paul says here in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 5. And this is why 
every time I'm given an opportunity to preach, I endeavor by God's grace to declare Christ and his glory. Paul said that here in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 5. We preach not ourselves. Preach is not to exalt himself. These that came to Moses and want to declare that they had as much significance as Aaron and, and the others. The Lord made it plain. No, the one purpose for his blessing Aaron was because Aaron was a type of Christ. That's the rod that budded. We preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. I believe every one of those terms is vital. We hear today, Jesus, 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 but who is he? See the sign that says Jesus is the answer, but what's the question? Here it is Christ Jesus the Lord. When I hear people speaking like that, my ears perk up because they're attributing to him all of his glory, just like that candlestick represents all the glory of Christ in every aspect, every attribute. How do we preach ourselves? Your servants for Jesus' sake. In other words, we're not to exalt the preacher. We're thankful when the Lord raises up a preacher to point us to Christ, but there's no light in that preacher apart from what the Lord's given. And that's the same for everyone that the Lord has come and redeemed. God has justified through his finished work. Verse 6, for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. What's he talking about there? He's going all the way back to creation. That very first command, let there be light. It says, hath shined where? In our hearts. To give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The temple of God is Christ. And when all says that ye are the temple, of Christ, of God. He's talking about the church collectively as individual members chosen of God and brought in. Who is our light? How is it that we have any understanding of God and his glory in the face of Jesus Christ as described here is through that light that he gives us. In fact, over in Revelation 21, and I'll close with this, in verse 23, people talk about heaven as if it's a place with physical activity going on, streets of gold, houses, mansions, all these things that people understand in physical terms. But again, the book of Revelation is a spiritual book. And yes, it is literally, heaven is literally not just a place, but a person. And as we read here in Revelation 21 and verse 23, we're beginning in verse 22, and I saw no temple therein. He's talking about here of Jerusalem, of the heavenly Jerusalem, described in terms of gates and 12 pearls. All of this is significant. When it says the street of the city was pure gold, that, that's talking about it was pure God. Everything about this has to do with God having been manifest in the flesh, like Christ said to the thief on the cross, today you shall be with me in paradise. As it was, as it were, transparent glass, and I saw no temple there. Why is there no temple there? Why is there no physical temple? Well, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. You know, that's what's represented in heaven. Hey, most religious folk today wouldn't be happy in heaven anyway. It's not what they're looking for. The reality is, here's a place here on earth where they can come and hear the gospel of Christ, but they go right on by. That's not what they're after. They want the works, the activity, but there's no place for that in heaven. There's only one glory in heaven, and that's what's described in verse 23. And the city had no need of the sun neither of the moon, to shine in it for what? The glory of God did lighten it. And the Lamb is the light thereof. That's why I can go back and look at the candlestick and say, that's the Lamb. It's a picture of the Lamb, the gold beaten out, his suffering. 
the almond representing, again, they had to be beaten out, but his life from his death, all of these things. And it says there in verse 24, and the nations of them which are saved, in other words, when Christ paid their sin debt, these are people from every tribe, nation, and tongue. How were they saved? Through the blood of the Lamb. They walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. Who are the kings of the earth? He made unto us a kingdom of priests. Those represent every one for whom he paid the debt. So we've just touched the surface, but I'm going to stop there and pray the Lord bless what we've heard. Let's take our hymn books and turn to hymn number 309. Beneath the cross of Jesus. Beneath the cross of Jesus, I faith would take my stand. The shadow of a mighty rock within a weary land, a home within the wilderness. A rest upon the way from the burning of the noonday heat and the burden of the day. Upon that cross of Jesus, mine eye at times can see the very form of one who suffered there for me, and from my smitten heart with tears to wonders I confess the waters of his glorious love and my worthlessness. I take across thy shadow for my abiding place. I ask no other sunshine than the sunshine of his face. Content to let the world go by to know the gain or loss, my sinful self, my only shame, my glory all the cross. Thank you, Peggy. We're going to do something a little different this time as far as our scripture reading. Choose these portions of scriptures we meet around the Lord's table. I'm trying to go in a little bit of an order this way. The Lord's made my mind. Read the, the story in Matthew and then Mark and Luke. But when we get to John, there really is not a specific part where the Lord directed John to describe that last supper that Lord partook with his disciples before he went to the cross. I know a lot of people will relate to what is written earlier on with the washing of the disciples' feet, but that was earlier on in the week. And yet in John, we do have the Lord's Prayer for his disciples. This is what I consider to be the true Lord's Prayer. But he taught his disciples. That's the disciples' prayer. The Lord taught his disciples to say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. But here's the Lord's prayer. This is what our Lord was praying to the Father before he went to the cross. And I want to read this because as we partake of the Lord's table here, we're partaking of what he came and accomplished in his life and in his death. That's what we're here to remember. It's not just a ceremony that we're going through. But this unleavened bread represents his body. And then this cup 
represents his blood shed. Both are necessary. It took Christ coming in a body. And this bread that we hold in our hand is unleavened bread, which means without sin. It's not your normal bread that you go and buy in the marketplace. Christ was not a common man. He was unlike any other. It can't be said of any man that they were without sin. He, he's the only one without sin. And so as he gave this bread to his disciples on that final eve of the Passover, it was that they might be reminded, first of all, he said, this is my body, which is broken for you, this doing remembrance of me. But it also has marks of fire on it flame it's a reminder that the reason a body was given to the lord jesus christ and made for him was that he might die and suffer under god's wrath and justice to save such people as we are even that overwhelms me to think that here we hold an element that he has given us but it wasn't just enough that he come as a perfect man but he had to shed his blood Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. That's where God in one time, in one place, in one sacrifice justified, declared righteous his people once for all. People that try to put it in faith or somewhere else, they, they still have not seen the glory of Christ's finished work accomplished there at Calvary. But what I want us to do is just simply, I want to read for you a few of these verses from John 17, because this was the prayer that he prayed in the garden as he went to the cross, having already celebrated the Lord's table, the Lord's supper with them. It says, these words, John 17, spake Jesus and lift up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. We talk about the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, that specific hour that was determined from before time now had come. We don't find Christ in any way halting from what he was about to endure, but rather he set his face like a flint toward Jerusalem, it says. And here he speaks of that hour as glorifying the Father. He said, glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. As a man, he was completely dependent upon the Father to carry him all the way through, because this was for the Father's glory. As he said, verse 2, as thou hast given him power over all flesh. Christ didn't die because people overpowered him. And when they came to arrest him a little later here in the garden, they came with swords and staffs, weapons, torches, the rest of them. The Lord, it says there in chapter 18, verse 4, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth. Went as a lamb to the slaughter, who before his shears is done, he opened not his mouth. He had power over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. I love that word, eternal life. As we've just seen, life is in, in the, the Savior, the Redeemer, in his finished work. And that's really what we're celebrating. In his death, we celebrate his life. And he says, this is eternal life, that they might know thee, the only true God. The word and there can be translated, even Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. These elements that we hold in our hand represent the only picture that the Lord has left us to remember him, his body and his blood. But it's all because of having been sent, and that in him is life eternal. See, that's what it is, verse 3, and this is life eternal. It's the person of Christ. So for the Lord, as we're celebrating Yes, his death, the body prepared, his blood shed, but we're celebrating his life. And the life that he has been pleased to give now to those for whom he died. He says, I have glorified thee, verse 4, 
on the earth, speaking of this physical, earthly journey. Some are surprised to hear when he says, even before dying, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. A little later, he'll cry from the cross, it is finished. So you say, well, which is it? Well, there was a work he came to do that was in earning and establishing the righteousness. It was necessary that he be without blame. And that's how he's addressing himself to the Father. That work of being the blameless lamb without sin in every trial, tempted in all things, yet without sin. That was the work he came to do. And he says, I've finished it. What he's doing is committing himself to the Father, to the Father's inspection. That lamb had to be inspected. Not just by men, even his enemies said, we find no fault in him. But more so, God himself. This was his lamb. And that's why he's able to say, I've glorified thee on the earth. I've finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, in light of the cross, it wasn't enough that he just lived this perfect life. He had to lay down his life. He had to shed his blood. The wages of sin is death. But he says, O oh, Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. It's talking about Christ's eternality. Yes, he came as a man, but he was before time. That's why he's the eternal God. Salvation is in him. Let's thank the Lord for the bread, cup, and then partake. Gracious Father, so much to take for granted that in this moment that you've given us to remember your son and his death, that as we partake, it would be out of thankfulness, praise to your name for all that you've accomplished for sinners such as we are. He alone is worthy. So we give you thanks and praise in his precious name. Amen. All right, let's take a couple of our hymn books. We'll stand and sing one final hymn, hymn number 222. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. 222, the stands of there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunge beneath that blood, lose all their guilty stains. Lose all their guilty stains. Lose all their guilty stains. And sinners plunge beneath that flood. Lose all their guilty stains. A dying thing. Rejoice to see that fountain in his faith. And there may I go while as he wash all my sins away. Wash all my sins away. Wash all my sins away. And there may I go by and see, wash all my sins away. Dear dying lamb, thy precious blood shall never lose its power. And all the ransomed church of God. Be saved to sin no more. Be saved to sin no more. Be saved to sin no more. And all the ransomed church of God, be saved to sin no more. 
sins by faith I saw the street, thy holy wounds supply. Redeeming love has been my theme, and shall be till I die, and shall be till I die, and shall be till I die. Redeeming love has been my theme, and shall be till I die. When this poor lisping every tongue, I silent in the grave. Then in a nobler, sweeter song, I'll sing thy power to save. I'll sing thy power to save. I'll sing thy power to save. Then in a nobler, sweeter song, I'll sing thy power to save. Amen. All right. We'll be dismissed before the next time. Lord willing.